Today I will show you the prototype board of my automated smart lights, the circuit diagram and how it all works. Also as a bonus, something funny and potentially very dangerous. What happened to my first prototype? What's up guys, my name is Sim and you're watching Smartest House, a channel where I show you how I design and build my smart home. If you're new to this channel, want to see more of what I do and want to learn how to create DIY projects for your own smart home, start now by subscribing and click on the bell icon so you wouldn't miss any new videos when I upload them. And I do that every week. Before we get started, I need to say that this project involves working with mains voltages that can kill. Take the utmost care when dealing with these sort of high voltages. If you don't feel comfortable working with this, don't. And if you do, don't forget the dangers. Let's say you have an LED light strip like this that you want to control the intensity of. These usually run at 12 volts DC. To dim a DC load, you would need to use a MOSFET and turn it on and off really fast, tens of thousands of times a second. If in a single cycle, you have switched it on for half the time and off the other half. Effectively, you only deliver half the current, which in turn, lights the LEDs only at half brightness. Changing the ratio between on and off time, in turn changes the brightness. This is called PWM, or pulse width modulation. As said, that works for DC, but not AC. And alternating current is what we have in our wall plugs. Mains voltage is either 110 or 220 volts with 50 or 60 Hz frequency, depending which part of the world you live in. Here in Australia and in Estonia where I'll be moving, mains is 220 volts at 50 Hz, and that is what I'll be using from now on. This red line shows the sine wave that comes from a wall socket. When dimming lights using AC, we use something called phase angle control. That means the cycle length we have to work with is half of one full cycle. With 50 Hz frequency, there is 100 half cycles per second. Let's say I have the switch off. After the phase crosses the zero point, called the zero crossing, I start counting. I'll count to five with each count being one millisecond long. Now I'll turn the switch on until the phase moves to zero again, then turn it off and start counting again. This way I have delivered only half of the power to my lamp. By changing the length of my count, I can thus change the brightness of the light. I will divide the length of one half wave by 100 and use each increment as 1% of intensity. Because the wave is sinusoidal, each increment doesn't actually represent 1%, but the difference won't be that big and for simplicity's sake, I'll leave it like that. A circuit will need to detect the point where the AC voltage goes to zero, the zero crossing point. It needs to be able to know when to turn on a specific switch and then also give a signal to turn it on. And finally, we need the switch to be able to react fast enough to do all the switching. For the signal where I'm reading the zero point from, I'll use a step down transformer. I do this because I find best to avoid working with high voltage whenever I can. I also use an optocoupler to galvanically isolate the two sides of the circuit. The transformer outputs 12.5V AC and the Atmega 328P uses 5V DC. Needless to say, they shouldn't be connected. Here I have a diode that only lets the first part of the wave through and blocks the second part, and a current limiting resistor. During the first part of the wave, current is allowed to flow, which turns on the LED inside the optocoupler. During the second part, the diode blocks the current and the LED is off. Every time the LED is on, it turns on the transistor on the opposite side. When the transistor is on, current flows down this path. When the transistor is off, the current goes down this path. So, every time the AC wave is on the first half, the voltage at this point is zero. Every time the AC wave is on the second half, the voltage here is plus 5 volts. That means when the AC wave crosses zero, 
This voltage goes either from 0 to 5 or 5 to 0. See what we have here? If we set up the AdMega chip to trigger an interrupt every time it detects a logical change here, we have successfully created a zero crossing detector for our circuit. I will talk about the code I have inside the AdMega chip in more detail in the next video. But essentially what's happening is once the zero crossing is detected, a timer starts and turns on the needed pins. Before the half cycle ends, turns off all the pins that are not supposed to be at 100% and checks if there is any new commands coming in before starting everything all over again. This cycle runs 100 times a second. Atmega chips use 5 volts DC. There is no way we could directly switch the voltage like 220 volts with it. Luckily there is a component perfect for the job, a triac, triode for alternating current. When a triac is triggered, it starts conducting and only stops when the current falls below a certain threshold. Then we need to trigger it again. So in our case, when the Atmega chip sends a trigger signal, the triac turns on. If the requested light intensity is less than 100, the chip turns the trigger signal off before the half wave ends and the AC voltage crosses zero, thus making the triac turn off at zero crossing. Then after the correct time has passed, the triac is triggered again. To isolate the Atmega from mains voltage, I've used an opto-isolator, MOC3021. It's different from the one I used for zero crossing detection. The 4N25 only lets the current pass one way, whereas the MOC3021 lets it flow in both directions. Essential for driving triacs. The triac I've used is a BT136. It's rated at 600 volts, plenty for the 220 volts I'll be using, and with a 4 amp maximum current rating. Once that makes a sense that trigger signal, current flows through this limiting resistor, through this LED in the isolator, and then through this LED I've added here. The last LED is for indicating if the triac is turned on or not. When the LED in the opto-isolator is turned on, current can flow through here. Here, mains voltage is used to trigger the triac, and the resistor is for limiting the current that goes through the isolator. Once triggered, current flows down this path to our lamp and then to the neutral terminal, thus lighting up the lamp. At the moment, this circuit doesn't have any fusing or really any safety features apart from the opto-isolators. It's dangerous and not really pretty, but it works. And now to show you what happened to my first prototype. I had it all soldered up and I was testing it with 12 volts DC both on the zero crossing and the live side. Everything worked. Then I connected the 220 volt supply, went to plug it in and this actually isn't the first one that blew up. I didn't film that one. I soldered in a new triac, set up the camera and powered it up again. And again. Needless to say, I enjoyed watching it go bang. The triacs exploded. But why did it happen? I don't know actually why it happened. The first triacs I was using were the TIC 206Ms which according to the datasheet should have easily coped with the current and the high voltage. I got these a few years ago from my friend, so I don't actually know where they're from and it could be that they're actually not what they marked as. So the moral of the story is, get your parts from a reputable source. And that is it for this video. If you liked it, hit the like button and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe so you wouldn't miss any new ones. In the next video, I'll be talking about the code that runs inside this Atmega chip. Until then, take care, and I'll see you next time.